A very good evening and welcome. You're watching the 7 o'clock news here on CNC3. I'm Ria Rambley. Let's tell you what's making the news tonight. There are one or two employees who have attempted to come to work today and they were denied entry onto the compound by their managers. Despite being granted access to their workplace, TSTT turns away retrenched employees. The union believes the company's days are numbered. With dozens of manholes stolen, the works minister says theft is costing taxpayers millions. I'm going to give you something nobody's ever seen. More documents on crimes at children's homes released. This time, allegations of an underground network which protects abusers. Good evening, I'm Ryan Beachu. Here's what's coming up in sport. West Indies test captain Craig Braffitt warns Bangladesh will be a decisive test series in an exclusive interview with CNC3 Sports. An adverse weather alert goes into effect for Trinidad and Tobago as an active tropical wave is on the approach. Join me, Kalei Hussein, for the details in tonight's weather forecast. Top of the news tonight, the Communication Workers Union will lead a march through Port of Spain in response to TSTT's recent retrenchment of over 450 workers. Clyde Elder says there are concerns of more workers facing the chopping block. He now suspects the actions are a deliberate attempt by government to wind up the company. Here's Jesse Ramdeo with more. Hours after being served with retrenchment notices on Tuesday, employees of the telecommunication services of Trinidad and Tobago were handed a lifeline. With a court order permitting 376 workers access to their workplace, those who opted to show up on Wednesday, however, were turned back. There are one or two employees who have attempted to come to work today and they were denied entry onto the compound by their managers. They were told that they will not be allowed on the compound that basically there's nothing for them to do and therefore they will not, they, there's no need for them to come. Communication Workers Union General Secretary Clyde Elder said after being disconnected from TSTT, employees were left grappling. The workers are very much demotivated, they are disenchanted, they are dejected, they are angry in some instances. Tuesday's retrenchment of 468 workers followed the termination of 503 workers back in 2018. On both occasions, TSTT cited the need for organizational transformation for profitability as the cause for the retrenchment exercises. With less than 1,000 workers out the door in four years, elders suspected more would follow, and he explained why. The company and government's strategic goal in all of this is to decimate TSTT, to get rid of TSTT. And by doing that, you get rid of the communication workers union and, and you get rid of decent paying jobs. And you give all of those services now over to Amplia. According to Elder, about 600 workers at the cash losing entity were now faced with shouldering the burden of a labor force of over 2,500. The union boss has assured that the voice of the impacted employees will be heard. Uh, we have requested permission from the police to march from. TSTT office on any street to parliament Friday from 10 to 1. We expect all of the employees who have been served with retrenchment notices, all of the retirees who are still owed money, all of the retrenched workers of 2018 who are still owed money, all of the employees who are currently working in TSTT now are still owed money. We expect all of them to come out. Several unsuccessful attempts were made to contact TSTT's CEO, Lisa Agard, for a response to elders' claims. Jesse Ramdeo, CNC3 News. The growing trend of attacking public infrastructure is now costing taxpayers millions of dollars. And the Works and Transport Minister is tonight saying the government may not be able to afford replacing some of the stolen equipment. The most recent incident took place in San Grande on Monday, where over 20 manholes were stolen. Bovita Gopalchan has this story. The growing appetite for copper and metal is now threatening critical infrastructure. Like this one, 22 of these along Arboot Road in Sangre Grande were stolen on Monday. This is opposite a school. So apart from we, you know, the, the, the losing the infrastructure there, we have put the, the students' life at risk because they have to actually walk on these pavements without covers. And then again, approaching the rainy season, you have garbage and so going down into these underground drains and that will contribute to flooding as well. But the minister says this is now part of a bigger problem. And a lot of the, the cables that we have for water pumps, water spin, 
um, would have been attacked. And right now, the pumps in Port of Spain, we have to use substitute pumps. So we have been having some serious attacks on the, the infrastructure in terms of, you know, people using it for scrap iron and, and, and selling it like that. We also had the QRF interchange, um, the brand new QRF interchange with, with these modern lights being targeted where they came and they stole all the lights, um, all the cable and so on. The minister says he's concerned that public infrastructure is now being targeted. Just last week, there was an arson attempt to sabotage the flooding pump at Bamboo Number no. 3. Minister Sinanan says they will now have to find millions of dollars to replace these equipment. Take, for instance, the QRF lights. I don't know if we'll ever be able to get that back up and running again because most of those things have to be shipped in and so on. The cost is significant. The pumps in Port of Spain, I mean, it'll take a long lead time to get them back working the way we, they, they should be. Um, so we have to use substitute pumps there. These manual covers, we're going to have to come up with a different system because, I mean, if we put back the metal there, they will steal them again. He says cameras and security fences are being installed around some of the infrastructure. The Works and Transport Minister says he has already reached out to the National Security Minister about the problem. And he's also planning to meet with the Trade Minister to discuss measures to be put in place to prevent the export of stolen materials. Pavita Gopolchan, CNC3 News. To some other news now, the chairman of the 1997 report into children's homes is telling the government to be wary of an underground network that protects abusers. Robert Sapka released more documents today revealing some of the actions of this underhand group. Before any change can happen, Sabga believes this system must be dismantled. Akash Samaru has more. This document has never been reported on before. I'm going to give you something nobody's ever seen. These five pages were not attached to the 1997 report that was recently released to the public. But its contents, according to Robert Sabga, explain why the system of abuse is allowed to fester and thrive at children's homes. It's why he is today telling Minister Yana Webster-Roy that even though he believes she is out of her depth in these matters, before any change can happen, she needs to... Recognize that there are forces within the system that are working against her. And those forces, according to Mr. Sabga, were very active in working against his committee in 1997 and limited their findings. You see, he said there were strange happenings that occurred during their work which forced him to tell then Minister Manohar Ramsaran that there is something fishy going on in the bowels of the ministry. Something they can't put their fingers on that's not right on the inside. There's an underground network at play. In that document, Samgas said that Holmes knew when they were coming to investigate and therefore it is not inconceivable that this underground network was tracking their movements. In fact, he said that three members of the task force were employed in the Ministry of Social Development and were constantly badgered by the then permanent secretary who demanded information on their movements. The five-page document goes on to say that at that time, many files in the ministry simply went missing and they could not follow any paper trails with respect to subventions. It's why they could not find out why a home with no residence was in receipt of an annual subvention of $75,000. It was part of what the document called the money machine, where he said the government was being swindled from within. Sabga believes this needed to be revealed as he's not at all happy with how things are transpiring in light of the reports. I'm fed up of the, uh, of the lies and the misrepresentations that are out there. He said there was nothing more his team could have done and the report was never hidden from the police. The police knew why didn't we give a copy of the report to the police? Manohar Ramsaran was asked by uh, Hilton Guy for a copy and he physically gave it to him. And he said so far the police have not approached him during their investigation. And he is now telling the Prime Minister he has nothing to apologize for. For what? What did I do? For what? Yeah, he Instead, he believes the government should forget the politics, focus on what is in front of them, and tell the public why abusers highlighted in the Judith Jones report are still working at the facilities. Do better. You want to do something? Do better. Stop with the rubbish. Akash Samaru, CNC3 News.
Well, we reached out to Minister Ayanna Webster Roy, who was not aware of the contents of the document released today. But she said, notwithstanding, her focus right now is on the 2021 report. Minister Webster Roy said while she awaits the work of the task force, her ministry has been working to strengthen the child protection machinery. CNC3 News understands the task force should release its action plan soon. I will not ask for an extension to the six weeks allocated for its work. That deadline should be around June 10th. Well, let's tell you what's still to come in the news this evening. Responding to Kuba Bank burglary, acting top cop says police could easily mistake a break-in for construction work at business places. Straight off a plane and into handcuffs, we'll tell you why the DSS founder was arrested and charged. Welcome back to the 7 p.m. news. The mask mandate will be reviewed in July. This is according to Minister of Health, Minister of Health Terence Dial Singh. However, he says it will need to remain in place for the time being. He says the decision to remove the mandate will come after careful consideration of the country's COVID-19 situation to ensure it does not have to be reinstituted. He says giving into public pressure can create more problems than the country needs right now. When you do that, uh, you give into public pressure. And then you have to reintroduce the mandate as other countries have had to do. You find that the public loses all faith in the, in the government. They lose all faith in the measures because they don't like the yo-yo in of positions. The mandate was implemented in August 2020. The health minister says the review will come at the end of the current period of the public health regulations on July 31st. Acting top cop McDonald Jacob is tonight coming to the defense of Coover police. This follows a barrage of criticism stemming from a break-in at Republic Bank located just opposite the Coover police station. According to Jacob, the police are not to blame. Sasha Wilson and Sashri Budan bring us more. Coover police may be facing heavy fire by the public over the Republic Bank break-in but not from Acton Police Commissioner McDonald Jacob. I don't feel it was generally because of the any kind of lackadaisical manner of the police. I feel is that they came to certain belief that there was in fact a legitimate work going on there. So how were the bandits able to break a hole in the bank's wall undetected by the police with the station located directly opposite? The police might be there and they may see certain activities going on and they may be uh, they may be of the opinion that is is in fact legitimate persons who are carrying out this work because they will dress like that, they will organize in the, the, the normal working apparel. The acting commissioner is now asking banks and other institutions to let the police know when they have planned works. This demonstrates to us the extent in which the criminal elements right, are going in order to get the economic way of operating within our society. Everybody want to get money, right? And they want to get gains by not working, right? And doing what, doing the right things. Jacob says apart from murders and drugs, gangs are now involved in robberies, illegal quarrying, extortion, and other crimes. But we have arrested several persons, and I want to mention the whole aspect of that again in relation to where they are getting bail and the re and a kind of recycling is taking place. But we have put measures in place. Our intelligence is developing, and uh, we will, in fact, be dismantling these gangs within a short period. Up to press time, no one has been arrested in connection with the break-in. Sasha Wilson, CNC3 News. The founder of what was once this country's largest SUSU organization has been charged with four counts of money laundering. Karen Clark was arrested straight off a flight at the Piaco International Airport on Monday. The police service confirmed that officers of the Special Investigations Unit subsequently handed him over to the officers of the Financial Investigations Branch who laid the money laundering charges. The advice came from the Deputy Director of Public Prosecutions. An official statement from the police service confirms that Clark was granted bail in the sum of $80,000 with a surety by a justice of the peace. Clark is scheduled to appear at the Arima Magistrates Court in under a month's time on June 27th. DSS was first raided in September 2020 by SORT officers 
Some 22 million in cash was taken to the La Hoketa police station but was later released. DSS is now at a standstill with many citizens unsure when they will receive monies paid into the money scheme. The prisoner who allegedly attempted to escape from a moving prison van has been granted $150,000 bail. Justin Ramlochan was released from hospital on Tuesday and then taken to the Shiguanas police station where he was charged for escaping lawful custody. Ramlochan appeared at the Shiguanas magistrate's court today but pleaded not guilty. However, his attorney told the court there seems to be some level of foul play. Ramlochan, who had a bandage over his eye, is expected to return to court on June 13th. He is also accused of breaking into a woman's apartment, assaulting her and destroying and stealing her property. A small businesses struggling due to the pandemic will soon have a chance to benefit from an additional $20 million in COVID-19 relief grants from the National Entrepreneurship Development Company. This from NEDCO's chairman, Clary Ben, who is speaking today during a parliamentary committee examining the company's finances. Ben says over 5,000 business owners applied for the grant, but NEDCO's funding ran out. There was a large group of persons who were eligible for the grant, but resources were totally exhausted. And so I could tell you that the Ministry of Finance has agreed to allocate an additional tranche of $20 million towards the end of 2022. As NEDCO's financial reports were examined, the committee found that some $66 million in loans were written off by the company in 2017. And although audited reports on NEDCO's operations for 2018, 2019, and 2020 are not yet ready, the company's CEO was able to provide the cost of these audits to the committee. Chairman, the total cost for the uh, auditing of four years, as we anticipate for 2021, would be 630,000. It's costing NECO $157,500 um, approximately per year. The committee's chairman, Wade Mark, chastised NECO's management saying the committee has been waiting too long for the results of its audits. NEDCO, in turn, promised the results would be presented to the committee before the end of this fiscal year. Our LNG production is on the up. Energy Minister Stuart Young has responded to a Reuters report that suggests Trinidad and Tobago's LNG's production is going in the wrong direction. Peter Christopher tells us more in tonight's Business Watch. The following Business Watch feature is brought to you by Visa, everywhere you want to be. Energy Minister Stuart Young says Trinidad and Tobago's LNG exports are poised to rise in 2022, in spite of reports which suggest otherwise. During his speech at day two of the Trinidad and Tobago Energy Conference, Minister Young took the chance to respond to an article from Reuters that Trinidad and Tobago's production is moving in the opposite direction of Peru, who appeared set to increase exports. Our LNG exports, even with a reduced natural gas input, is double, more than double, what is taking place out of Peru. And at the right time, the statistics can be provided to show that our production out of Atlantic LNG has actually increased and is projected to increase with more cargoes going out this year, 2022, than in 2021. He adds geopolitical issues have bolstered LNG prices, which means increased returns for the state. The energy minister was confident that the ongoing restructuring of Atlantic LNG and its plant would increase efficiency and sustainability. The improved prices will result in increased netbacks to the upstream and increased revenue to the government from taxation. The National Monitoring, Reporting and Verification System, which will oversee our emissions as we seek to reduce carbon usage in a bit to move to clean energy, is being adjusted. During a speech at the Energy Conference, Planning Minister Penelope Beckel says while stakeholders within the private and public sector have already subscribed to the system, its scope needs to be widened. Notwithstanding the excellent response to providing data to the MRV, it is not enough 
and we are taking steps to include greenhouse gas reporting and verification into the legislative framework for mandatory reporting. Beckles also confirms a grant of approximately 1 million US dollars on the capacity building initiative for transparency of the Global Environment Facility has been accessed to strengthen the MRV system to ensure its enhanced transparency framework compliance under the Paris Agreement. Christopher, CNC3 Business Watch. The preceding Business Watch feature was brought to you by Visa. Everywhere you want to be. Abducted Venezuelan national Mariesi Carolina Barrios Badayo has been released. Police say the 22-year-old woman was released by her abductors and subsequently made her way to her Wallerfield home where she contacted Arima CID. Officers responded and she was taken to hospital where she was medically examined by the district medical officer. Baldayo recently came to TNT from Venezuela and was staying at an apartment. According to police, at around 2 a.m. on Tuesday, bandits broke into the apartment using bolt cutters and other housebreaking apparatus. The men ransacked the apartment, taking valuables, and subsequently bundled Baldayo into their vehicle and left with her. Her family is now thanking God that she's been released. Well, still to come in the news, we address a local medical myth in tonight's Wellness Wednesday. Can urine determine someone's maturity? Good evening, everyone. Across Trinidad and Tobago today, it was variably cloudy. We have lots of upper level clouds moving across the country, but we also have a fairly active tropical wave on the approach to Trinidad and Tobago, prompting the Met Office to issue an adverse weather alert for the country. I'll have the details later in the newscast. A male child and a middle-aged man are Trinidad and Tobago's latest COVID-19 deaths in the last 24 hours. The death toll now stands at 3,919. In the last day, there were 206 new COVID-19 cases, with active cases just below 9,000. In the same period, there were nearly 600 recoveries, while 180 people are still warded in hospitals due to COVID-19. The risk of myocarditis from the pediatric COVID-19 vaccine is significantly lower than if a child were to contract any virus. This is according to pediatric emergency specialist at the NCRJ, Dr. Joanne Paul. She says over 10 million doses were administered to children ages 5 to 11 in the United States, with just one or two very mild cases showing up. She says there have also been no major side effects or deaths reported globally. So the reality is that all viruses can have a small risk of myocarditis, and this vaccine for 5 to 11 is even less of a risk. And so that's why they say now the risk is so negligible that for most countries it's zero. Of, there's no risk of myocarditis, and it's less than even a normal or flu virus or gastroenteritis virus or hand for the mouth virus. It's Recently, a small group of doctors came out against the ministry's plan to vaccinate all children in the 5 to 11 age group, regardless of their risk. However, Dr. Paul defends the position. She says countries have decided to either give it to just high-risk children or to all, regardless of their risk profile. She says this latter approach adopted by TNT is a better choice. Because what happens is that... If all of them are protected, you have less transmission to everyone. So by protecting the low risk, you're actually protecting the higher risk also. According to Health Minister Terence Dial saying there are over 100,000 children eligible for the vaccine between ages 5 to 11. He says today just over 800 have since been administered a first dose in the last week. As COVID-19 cases went up during the pandemic, there's been fewer people suffering with the flu. However, the Pan American Health Organization says influenza cases are once again on the rise. During PAHO's weekly briefing today, Director Dr. Carissa Etienne said 
It comes at a time when countries are facing another surge of COVID-19 infections. She said influenza is again circulating, not only during the traditional flu season. Many places are facing the double threat of a potential influenza surge alongside a rise in COVID-19 cases, which will put healthcare workers, the elderly and pregnant women at additional risk. Some countries are facing a triple threat with the addition of an RSV wave in children. With COVID-19 cases and deaths climbing for a sixth consecutive week, Dr. Etienne warns that this is a risk for health systems. Therefore, authorities should track hospital capacity closely. Now, what does it mean if someone asks you if your urine is frothing? For many young men, it's a question they would have been asked when they began acting older than their age. But is there any underlying truth to this, to this common saying? Rashad Khan explores more in tonight's Wellness Wednesday. Wellness Wednesday, brought to you by BioStrand. Get what you need naturally. All right, so this is a question strictly for the guys alone. Has any adult ever asked you all if you feel your pee in froth? And what did you do to get them to ask you that? I bet you were behaving mannish. I can't remember the exact circumstance. I heard it more than once. Um, but I know it is probably something I would have done or said all the time. Eh? And it was their way to kind of put me in place. But that was a common question that um, teachers would ask students, especially at a boys' school. They would accuse the boy of throwing um, detergent or something in the toilet before he, um, before he urinates. And they said, well, let her fool you, you know, you ain't in front yeah. And for the woman who may be confused, don't worry. We were too when we first heard it. She was like, um, Philip is a big man now, you get or something like that, right? So I was like, why not show my people what's on? <laughs> I don't know. Is that like I get immature? Now, I know it sounds strange, but believe it or not, you can actually tell a lot about a person by their urine. For instance, if they're on any drugs, if they're dehydrated, or even if they have any underlying health conditions. But what we want to find out specifically is can it also tell when you have now become a man? So we visited nationally renowned urologist Dr. Lester Goetz. While he's heard of the theory, he does not believe there's any link between frothy urine and becoming a man. Uh, you're getting, you're getting big now, you're a big man. Yeah. Adults, uh, nothing to do with puberty, no. Instead, he says frothy urine is usually a sign of a more serious medical condition. Yeah, most of the times, when we test the urine, there are some germs in it, yeah. One theory suggests it's the mixing of urine and semen. It can, yes, yes, because the urine is coming out thicker. It's mixed with ejaculate. Yeah, it, mix, it is mixed with ejaculate. But a search on the internet offers other reasons, such as the speed which urine hits the bowl. But regardless, there's no change that happens when a boy becomes a man to lead to the occurrence. Rashad Khan, CNC3 News. Wellness Wednesday, brought to you by BioStrand. Get what you need naturally. We now join Colleen Hussein for a look at our weather forecast. And Colleen, we can expect some rain tonight. Yep, not only tonight, not only tomorrow, but through the weekend and even into next week, we have a very active tropical wave approaching. So let's take a look at what's going on in the atmosphere. We have an active tropical wave to our east that's forecast to begin affecting Trinidad and Tobago from overnight tonight, but the bulk of the showers and thunderstorms will begin on Thursday morning and continue into Friday and even into the weekend, but the bulk of the activity, the more severe stuff, that begins at 8 a.m. tomorrow, and that's why the Met Office has put Trinidad and Tobago under a yellow level adverse weather alert from 8 a.m. tomorrow through 2 p.m. Friday. So let's take a look at what they are calling for. Thunderstorms and heavy showers, gusty winds in excess of 55 kilometers per hour. In those heavy showers and thunderstorms, we can expect to see some street or flash flooding with those heavy showers really favoring southern and eastern areas overall, but we really can't see it across both islands throughout the next couple of hours and days. Now, frequent lightning will also be possible 
possible in thunderstorms and with increased winds at low levels of the atmosphere, mariners should look out for some choppy seas. So what should you do? Well, secure loose items outdoors tonight if you can. Once the rain starts and we start to see flooding, do not venture into flood waters. Plan ahead for your commute tomorrow because you know once the rain comes down, the traffic starts building up. Take shelter during heavy rainfall and thunderstorms, especially with frequent lightning. And for mariners, be on the alert for agitated seas. Now this tropical wave, we've been tracking it for the last several days. It's now going to move across Trinidad and Tobago, but all of this activity behind it, that's what's going to keep the rainfall on tap for us as we head into the weekend. But something else will also be coming, lots of Saharan dust that will be affecting us from late Friday through the weekend. So as we look to the weekend, we sensitive groups should take necessary precautions. And today is also the first day of the Atlantic hurricane season officially. We're monitoring two systems in the Atlantic, one with a high chance of development. That's not going to impact Trinidad and Tobago at all. The other with a low chance of development in the far western Atlantic. But the forecast for us over the next couple of hours tonight, mostly cloudy conditions with periods of isolated scattered showers, becoming thunderstorms in the morning temperature-wise, it's forecast to be relatively cool with temperatures around 23 to 24 degrees. Tomorrow, cloudy, rainy with thunderstorms as well. Maximum high struggling to get up to 30 degrees Celsius. So tomorrow when you're heading out, Walk with the umbrellas, walk with the flood boots if you're in Port of Spain, don't want to get those shoes wet, wet Rhea, and you know, plan ahead for the commute. Maybe walk with some extra snacks on your way in. <laughs> Definitely need to pack some boots, um, but you know, Colleen, I've been wondering a lot, the flash flooding usually happened during the dry season, maybe because we didn't have our, you know, drainage system that backed up. But going into the wet season, we're going to see our drainage systems just a little bit more full clogged. Well, and what's going to happen to our flooding situation? The good news is that we've had a fairly dry period over the last couple of days. So that means we'll have some time before the soils become saturated and we really start to see the street and flash flooding occur. But our street flooding really comes from those torrential thunderstorms dumping more than an inch of rain in an hour. And we expect to see some of that happening tomorrow and Friday. And also just a reminder, don't drive through flood waters. Turn around, don't drown. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Colleen. Let's tell you what's still to come in the news. With less than a week to go before the Summit of the Americas, the U.S. is still to finalize the invite list. Will Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicar Nicaragua make the cut? <music> an economist is tonight warning public servants to be careful what they wish for. Dr. Marlene Atz's comment follows questions about whether or not the workers' rejection of government's 2% increase over eight years is justified. Among the factors considered was the assurance of an income during the pandemic for public servants when the private sector had to make cuts. Dr. Atz said during the lockdown period, government relied on the service from the public sector and could not be used as a bargaining chip. She added that while calls for an increase in wages were warranted, given the pinch being felt of the rising cost of living, workers should tread cautiously. If they get a higher salary packet, um, whatever percentage, and 2% is not what they're after, I presume what they're after is a percentage salary increase that is commensurate with the rate of inflation, which is really not going to be a good thing because what will also happen is that hi that higher increase in salary could very well put our public sector workers in a higher tax bracket. They come back to square one. Dr. Ad said while she understands the pressures public sector workers faced, a salary increase was not necessarily the best solution at this time. She advised that government could offer incentives such as priority housing or even rebates on utility bills. Meanwhile, economist Dr. Roger Hussein was cautiously optimistic about the timeliness of a wage increase. And I hope good sense prevails and that the increase in salary that follows does not lead to an appreciation of the country's real effective exchange rate or alternatively sell a loss in our external competitiveness. Both Dr. Hussein and Dr. Atz made the comments during an interview with CNC3 News. Now to this, police officers are being praised for removing a 14-year-old girl who reportedly considered jumping from the top of the parkade building on Richmond Street today. CNC3 News understands someone saw the girl leaning over the top of the building just after noon and called police. Numerous attempts were made by police looking on. 
to encourage her to come down, but she refused. Police officers then went to the top of the building to meet the woman. There, the officers were able to grab the girl and bring her to safety. She was taken to the Central Police Station on St. Vincent Street, where she was interviewed and then taken for medical treatment. Now, amid calls for a CARICOM boycott of the Summit of the Americas, the United States is yet to decide the fates of Venezuela, Cuba, and Nicaragua. Since it has been reported that the three countries may not be included, CARICOM leaders have been meeting to decide if they will attend. However, speaking during a telephonic press briefing earlier today, a senior U.S. official indicated that the final invitee list has not yet been confirmed. We uh, still have some final considerations, but we will, um, I think, inform uh, people publicly soon uh, about the, the final invitation list. I think what's really important uh, for us in terms of the summit is why we are gathering, and, and that is to focus on our collective responsibility to forge a more inclusive and prosperous future for, for the hemisphere. So we've not been so focused on the on the who is and who is not invited and more really on the outcomes that we want to achieve at the summit. Gonzalez said the U.S. will speak with the leaders of the region and Mexico before a final decision is made. The event is to be held from June 6th to the 10th in Los Angeles. Well, let's hand you over now to Ryan Beatrice for a look at what's coming up in sport. Thanks, guys. Here's what's coming up after the break in sport. TNT senior football team touches down in Managua ahead of their opening Nations League clash with Nicaragua. Four players and the head coach, Angus Eve, miss the trip. And Muhammad Ali, not to be confused with the boxer, triumphs in the resurrection shooting tournament. Stick around. Sports is next. Welcome back. Stakeholders are tonight telling the government that battered men deserve more than just a shelter. Last Wednesday, Permanent Secretary in the Ministry of Social Development, Jacinta Bailey Sobers, told a joint select committee that a shelter for men will be up and running before the end of the year. President of the Single Fathers Association, Rondell Fields, says a shelter for men and boys is long overdue. He revealed that just Sunday, his organization had to help a man who was being abused. Gentlemen, I proceeded to the Aruka police station where you're going there and trying to make a report where he said they were very disrespectful. They, I mean, they treated him with disdain and scorn. They didn't take his report seriously. Some of them even laughed at him. And that um, is what that is a, a, a common occurrence when men have these issues of domestic violence. And that is why domestic violence by men will never, you'll never have a genuine statistic for it. Certified therapist Avis Joseph Edwards agrees that men are ashamed to report abuse by their partners. Joseph Edwards, who interviewed male victims of domestic violence and published research, said a shelter is a step in the right direction. I think men are crying out for action. They are crying out to be listened to. They want confidence when they speak to you. They want a safe space. Like I said, you know, for them to be able to express themselves, they have to cry, they have to break down, they have to pound the desk. They want all of that done in confidence. Joseph Edwards says counseling should also be provided at the shelter for men. The United National Congress is questioning why the telecommunications service wrote off $2.5 million owed by debtors. Opposition Senator Wade Mark raised the issue of TSCT's restructuring during a media conference at the office of the opposition leader in Port of Spain today. Wade Mark says TSCT's audited financial statements reveal that since acquiring Massey Communications in 2017, its viability and profitability declined. He said, had TSCT recovered that $2.5 million, the company would be in a better position to secure the jobs of its workers. Taking a look internationally, a jury in the United States has awarded Johnny Depp more than $10 million in his libel lawsuit against ex-wife Amber Heard. The jury also found in favor of Heard she was awarded $2 million in damages. The verdicts brought an end to a televised trial that Depp had hoped would help restore his reputation. 
Throughout the trial, fans on Depp's side lined up overnight for coveted courtroom seats. Spectators who could not get in gathered on the street to chair Depp and Jay Heard whenever they appeared outside. Heard said she was heartbroken by the verdict. Depp sued Heard for libel over a December 2018 op-ed she wrote in the Washington Post. Well, it's time to recap our headlines as we leave you. Despite being granted access to their workplace, TSAT turned away retrenched employees. The union believes the company's days are numbered. And with dozens of manholes stolen, the works minister says theft is costing his ministry millions. That brings us to the end of the 7 p.m. news here on CNC3. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Maria Rambley. Have a good night.